Hey guys, it's Austin Bach, and I'm bringing you some more Pioneer action here on Magic Online. Uh, some more White Black Auras, specifically, which is uh, the last time I played Pioneer. This is the deck I brought for you guys, but uh, we got a crucial new addition from Ikoria, which was Lurus of the Dream Den. Some of you might have seen during my uh, my draft video the other day. I opened this, which was very fortuitous because I needed it for this deck, and. Uh, Last time I think I went 1-4 and four in the league that we played, but uh, I still felt like the deck was strong, we just got a little bit unlucky, and uh, it turns out maybe I was correct, because uh, the very first league I played in, which was yesterday, we earned ourselves a trophy. Um, sadly I was not recording, but I thought uh, since I had a pretty good result, I would go through the replays and kind of commentate my thought process during the games, and uh, so you guys can see how I earned the 5-0. So this is very close to the list I played in the league. I think I added this Mana Confluence. I originally had a Swamp, and I think I also had a fourth Deadweight instead of the third Knight of Malice. But this is the list as I would play it now, moving forward. I'll also put this list in the description below if you're interested in picking up the deck for yourself, which I would highly recommend because this deck is insane. Lurish just puts it over the top, and I think it could be potential tier 1 deck in the format, so let's go ahead and get into the matches. Alright, so we get to kick off our first round by putting Luris in the companion zone, or whatever they call it, and we keep this opener. We get Thoughtseize turn 1, but that's okay because our hand had some redundancy. We get to play another creature. My opponent is leaving up Fatal Push mana, notably, so and drawing SRAM was nice for multiple reasons, because if I hadn't drawn SRAM I would have had a tough decision of whether to try to pile onto this El Sayed and play into Fatal Push, which he did in fact have. Opponent goes Uro, so they just got the nuts. And Deathrite Shaman, which I don't know how common this card is in... Uh... Here, let me pause here. It's going a little too fast. don't know how common Deathrite Shaman is in, uh... in Sultai Delirium. Maybe just as a one-of or something, but... It's actually a little bit annoying for us because of Luris, because we would like to replay like the SRAM from the graveyard, but he can prevent that. Um, it doesn't hit enchantments notably, so we can still get back like cartouches and all that good stuff, but <clears throat> Death Rite is definitely annoying. Anyway, moving forward, opponent has just got a blisteringly fast start here, and they get the Hostage Taker or Luris which not only takes away our ability to go off, but it means he can uh, make use of the Luris himself by replaying stuff from his yard. Now he gets back Uro. And like, we do have this uh, flying uh, attacker with a little bit of protection thanks to the Hateful Eidolon, but he is out life gaining us right now. We have no answer to the Uro. Tamiyo is filling the yard for his Luris, or our Luris, I should say, and his Deathrite Shaman, so this game was looking pretty over. I think after one more draw step, yeah, we called it quits there, and we go to sideboard. So for game two, as you can see, we brought in some sideboard tech. We've got the Apostle, which blanks all of his removal, um, but this is also an example of the kind of hand that would not be possible to keep before Luris was available. Because uh, if you imagine we got Thought Seized on his turn one, taking our Apostle, suddenly we have a bunch of enchantments and nothing to put it on. But having the ability to, uh, to have a guaranteed creature in our opening hand every game gives us a lot of leeway to keep hands like this that have such high potential. I probably would have kept it anyway and just hoped that there wasn't a Thought Seize coming, but it just makes us feel a lot better. In any case, we get the Apostle down opponent's off to a slightly slower start this time, and we get to just start piling on. I usually like to start with cartouches, just because there is sometimes a case where you want to put enchantments on your warriors, but in this case it's probably not going to end up being a problem because we can just pile on to this apostle. I don't even bother holding up Karmatcher's Blessing because I know there's like no way that he can get rid of this unless he's playing something weird like Brazen Borrower, which those decks just don't play. And this is a fairly simple victory, even with the Jace activation we just have Lethal here with the Ethereal Armor. 
and we go to game three. And on the draw here for game three, you can see we brought in even more tech. Hushbringer is interesting in this matchup because it turns off the likes of Ishkana, Hushbringer, or sorry, not Hushbringer, Hostage Taker. But it also kind of nombos against Uro because if they just play a three mana Uro, it just stays in play because there's no sacrifice trigger thanks to the Hushbringer. So it's kind of a it's kind of a give and take, but I think it's still worth playing because they have so many so many annoying ETB triggers that we want to turn off. So opponent once again representing Fatal Push mana. I'm going to start with Hushbringer because I'd rather wait on SRAM until I can guarantee get a draw off him first. Once again he's got that black mana up. We're going to put Ethereal Armor on the Hushbringer because he's always going to kill the, the SRAM. Pretty straightforward. Now we've got this Hushbringer slightly protected. We're going to go ahead and drop the Luris, which we can't protect right now, but it's still worth playing out. He's going to drop Nissa. So I think he probably misplayed this here because he wanted to play, uh, let me pause it once again. He wanted to play out the Jace. He had the mana to do everything, but I think what he probably should have done is just animated a Blooming Marsh and then post-combat minus Jace to Fatal Push the Luris. Or you know what, he actually couldn't do that. So never mind. He could Fatal Push the Hushbringer, but we could protect it, so. Disregard everything I just said. So anyway, we play Sram from the yard. And we're gonna go ahead and use a pump spell. So I need to pause again, because that was actually a pretty interesting turn. Because so I had to be very careful here. I was able to use the pump spell to kill Nissa but I still have to be worried about Jace flashing back Fatal Push in the future. And I had the option there of playing Apostle and holding up mana, but obviously that would let him uh, keep the Nissa going. So I just had to basically hope that we get to untap with a reasonable board here. He doesn't get to do too much to mess with us. We still have the Blessing up, um, so I was pretty much planning to lose this ram, but he at least got some value. And we could just get him back with the Luris, which is what part of why Luris is so insane. Even a string of removal here. Okay, let's pause once again, because my opponent cast Traverse the Ulvenwald there and got Hostage Taker, which I don't know if they realized that it would do nothing against Hushbringer, but as you can see, they're gonna play it here. and now they're going to traverse for Murderous Rider, which we'll have to keep in mind moving forward. Okay, once again, I need to pause. So I decided to kill off the Jace there, even though he has another Jace here, just because I didn't want him to be able to go like minus three to get like a traverse or whatever, and then just get, basically just get an extra activation out of the Jace. But now we have the Apostle in play and we've got the mana open to prevent this Jace from getting anything back that we don't want him to have. So I'm hoping to be able to hold up as much mana as possible for the rest of the game. So he tries to kill off Luris, but we protect it with Blessing. And crucially, he didn't have double black after that, so he wasn't able to play a second removal spell, which was lucky for us. There's Tamio. I don't know what, oh, she named uh, Ritual of Soot. So let me pause again here. So yeah, I ended up getting a little bit lucky here because Ritual of Soot would have wiped my board, but we drew Cartouche into Ethereal Armor, which was exactly lethal. So yeah, rather be lucky than good. And that's exactly 12. Could have made it more, of course, by playing the Eidolon, but we didn't need to. So yeah, well, that's Sultide Delirium down. All right, so for round two, unfortunately, there looks there appears to be a bug in the uh, replay system where both I and my opponent had a companion this game. You might notice my opponent's playing with an 80 card deck. That is because their companion is Yorian Sky Nomad. It's basically just five mana flyer that flickers any number of things that you want. It's good with a bunch of ETB triggers. So anyway, just keep that in mind. Uh, this, anyway, I had to mold a six here. I didn't show my opening hand, but I had no lands. Um, 
So yeah, for some reason the the client is glitched with uh, with this match. It doesn't show the companions, so I'm gonna have to kind of explain what happened. Anyway, here we get a Femia down, and we're gonna hold up Karametra's blessing in case of a bounce, which he has Teferi, so we have to protect it before it comes down. And I'm gonna hold the Griff Spoons here because I'm pretty sure that he's gonna be able to get rid of this Ephemia some way or another, and he does. And here I actually play the Luris and then put Ethereal Armor on it, but for some reason the client is glitched out here, so. Place Heliod. And then I just load up onto the Luris. <laughs> it's unfortunate I can't really show you guys this, but yeah, I just load up on the Luris and that ended up getting the job done for round number one. All right, for game two, we're on the draw, but we've got a nice little low to the ground hand here. Lead off with Hoplite. Here we just drop Sram, anticipating to uh, try to go to town next turn. But unfortunately, we get our Sram removed, so we just gotta pile on as much as we can. Here the opponent has Reflector Mage. So we just gotta try to pile on once again, get as much damage in as possible. Okay, here I'm gonna have to pause, because as you can see, once again the client is glitched out, but my opponent tapped five mana and played their commander, which I'll bring back in, or their companion rather. So these three cards, Charming Prince, Reflector Mage, Yorion, form an infinite combo. I mean, it's not like true infinite, but it's basically an infinite loop. So you Yorion, you flicker both of them. Uh, they come back in on the end step. Reflector Mage bounces something, and Charming Prince flickers the Yorion. And then on the following end step, Yorion comes back, and you repeat the loop again. So you just get to bounce all these triggers as many times as you want. And since our deck didn't have any instant speed interaction, we just threw in the towel here, because we have no way of interacting with that combo. Alright, for round three, we unfortunately have to mulligan all the way down to five, but we do have the trump card here, which is Knight of Malice, which a near mono white deck has a very hard time dealing with. And here, I think I just decided to drop two more creatures rather than start all this glittering. Here we go, Gideon. And here I actually have the decision of being mana efficient or just putting dead weight on the Charm Prince to get it out of the way. But I opted for all the glitters, basically forcing him to chump or lose the Gideon. He lost the Gideon. I think here I just dropped another. No, I dropped Sram, that's right. So unfortunately here, once again, is where the, uh, the client lags out because he casts his companion. But he doesn't have too much value going right now, luckily. Um, I mean, we'll play it forward. I don't actually know how this plays out. Yeah, this client is just completely bugged. But basically what happened is I think at some point I found a, a Griff Spoon and this Knight of Malice ended up getting the job done because his deck just has no way to kill it. So fortunately for round three, there are no bugs going on and we can actually see our companion there in the companion zone. Uh, we go ahead and keep the seven. The opponent did not reveal a companion, which is actually notable for a reason we'll see in a minute because we're playing the mirror. And as you're going to see over the course of this match, Luris is kind of a mirror breaker. So here, unfortunately, we don't have a lifelink threat to build onto, so we're kind of racing and we don't have a great, uh, you know, we don't have a way to recoup our life at the moment, but we do have the Luris, we have these All Sayeds. Um, but the real problem here is that the opponent has a SRAM, which we do not have. And when I say Luris is the, the Mirror Breaker, I should actually say that 
SRAM is the true mirror breaker because whoever has it basically wins and just starts to snowball with more and more enchantments and digs deeper into the deck. Here I think the opponent kind of messes up because they should, uh, let me pause here because this is actually a crucial interaction. Uh, the opponent should have just piled more onto this all Sayed and kept protecting it. I have no way to get rid of it and putting it, putting something on a favorite hoplite doesn't actually do anything because of the interaction between Luris and all Sayed of Life's Bounty. We can just basically infinitely chump. We can like, here I think we blocked with our warrior token and then sacrifice the all Sayed to give it pro white. And then because of Luris, we can just get back the all Sayed and rinse repeat the next turn. And that will come into play later on. And here, yeah, I decided to put ethereal armor on the all Sayed because I recognize that I need to start recouping some of our life loss here. But the opponent, is just really going off here with this all sad. They don't attack here, but it doesn't really matter because I just have no way of getting through that. Like, all sad can give something pro white, but we have no way to grow that creature because once you give something pro white, all the auras fall off of it. So, yeah, pretty much once they have a big giant flying lifelink monster like this, it's really going to be hard for you to, to get back into the game. So, we go to sideboard. Alright, so we keep this on the play. It's not like a stellar hand, but we do have a, a, a little minor engine going here. And one, one thing in the mirror you have to be careful of is Glare of Heresy. So I was pretty much just crossing my fingers that he didn't have it. But luckily he didn't, he just has his own monster. But here, as you'll see, um, he has a bigger creature than me for the moment, but mine flies and it has lifelink, so... This is going to be a pretty easy, pretty easy race to win. Yeah, here he just, he can hit me for 13 if he wants to, but then I just hit him back for lethal. And then on the draw for game number three, we've got an excellent hand. We can kill his first threat. We have SRAM. Those are the two key things, basically, to winning the mirror. He doesn't play a threat, but yeah, I'm definitely killing SRAM on sight here. So I go deadweight ethereal armor, getting my guy out of deadweight range. Again, if he has a Claire of Heresy, that's something, but he doesn't. We just SRAM and continue getting our creature in there. And here we actually have a race in our hands, because we both have giant lifelinkers. And we're kind of just uh, racing them against each other, but here is where Luris really starts to... Uh, really starts to shine here. He just rebought a dead weight for free from our graveyard. Again, he makes a giant hateful idol on here. But let's pause once again. Because unfortunately for my opponent, we once again have assembled the combo here. Let me try to go forward step by step. So this is the state of the board right now. The opponent's got a giant 21 power creature that unfortunately for him does not have flying. We have 18 power worth of flying in the air right now with the potential to make it bigger later. Um, and our opponent, unless they find a way to give the Hateful Eidolon flying this turn, like a Griff's Boon, they are not going to be able to get through our All Sayed. Because we can just block with SRAM and then sack All Sayed to give SRAM pro black and then get back the All Sayed do the same thing again, so this Hateful Eidolon basically can never get through. And that is going to matter here. They play another Hateful Eidolon, they attack, they give my SRAM Pro Black to prevent lifelink. I could have also just blocked with the All Sayed and sacked it to name anything. And here we just end up having lethal in the air for 20. So yeah, that's just a good example of why Luris is so insane and kind of a mirror breaker. All right, round four, we've got a fine little hand here. We are on the draw, and it looks like we're up against artifacts. Yep, indeed, blue-red. And they can have some scary starts, but if we're able to protect a threat, especially a lifelink threat, it's usually pretty hard for them to race. And here I pile on. The fact that this is a hateful Eidolon means I feel a little bit better about piling onto it without protection even if he has removal because uh, 
we get to at least draw some cards with the Hateful Idol on if uh, something weird happens. But here, yeah, now that I've got it out of Shrapnel Blast range, I'm pretty much not afraid of anything. I just pile on and uh, <laughs> even this doesn't matter. He doesn't have nearly enough damage to race a lifelink threat, and we would have just had lethal next turn anyway. Alright, so game two on the draw. We've got a little bit of a marginal hand. It has no interaction, but it does have a SRAM and a one drop, so I ended up keeping it. But unfortunately for us, the opponent has the fastest start possible, and that Ginger Brute is going to be really hard to, to handle because he can basically make it unblockable. And yep, we go to 7. So we can keep ourselves alive here by attacking with the Hateful Idol and going to 8, but we're basically just crossing our fingers that the opponent doesn't have something like Shrapnel Blast or Shock to the face. Crossing our fingers. Please don't do it to us, and he does it to us. <laughs> so we die on turn 4, but honestly I think we would have killed him. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, pretty much any enchantment would have won us the game there, or another Karmetra's Blessing, so <laughs> even though we died on turn 4, it was actually uh, kind of funny that we could have uh, could have maybe killed him on his turn, on our turn 4. But that's the way fast formats go sometimes. And on the play for game 3, we kept this hand. It was a nice looking hand. We can kill his first threat, we can get SRAM going, but unfortunately it ended up not being a game at all, because uh, as you can see, the opponent timed out. I don't know, there's a lot of weird connection issues, because it was uh, the first day of a new set. There's probably a lot of people on the client, so kind of unfortunate anticlimactic end to the game. But I think we still would have been in pretty good shape here, even if the game had played out as normal. And for the final round of the league, funny enough, our opponent also has a companion. We reveal Luris, and the opponent reveals Obosh, the Prey Piercer. So basically it means you have to only play odd odd converted mana cost cards, but it also pretty much doubles all of your damage, which is pretty scary if you're willing to put in the work to meet this requirement. So obviously we have to mulligan this opener, but we keep six. The opponent appears to be on red-green, which I think is a pretty good home for Obosh, and I think this could actually be a deck that we see more of in the future, but in any case, we get a little bit lucky. We draw another one mana enchantment, so we get to get in with our All Sad. But this actually ends up being one of the wildest games I've played in a long time, and you'll see why in a minute. Get yet another All His Glitters. He just has to chump block. So the opponent. Okay, I need to pause here and explain a little crucial interaction here. The opponent has the Great Hand active. Played it on turn 3 actually, which is pretty impressive. Um, so that means that they're basically going to have an endless stream of card selection. And they just played a Clothis, which has a bunch of text, but the main thing is that it's got Indestructible. Which means that he can just block this all Sayed for days. I'm going to gain a bunch of life, but he's not going to be taking lethal damage or losing any creatures. So pretty much all I need to do this game is to draw a either another All Sayed, so I can name Pro Green and get in, or a Griff Spoon, just to send it to the air, and it will be lethal. Just explaining that now in context of what ends up happening this game, which is pretty hilarious. Here we draw another land, so we just get to drop two more All His Glitters and get in there. And I'm not really scared of him being able to kill a 26-26. Green Red is usually not that great about killing creatures that are bigger than their own creatures. So I pretty much have all the time in the world here. So I just end up chumping to save myself some damage. Gain a bunch of life. Play the Luris just because I can. Got nothing else going on. Alright, and Lovestruck Beast does notably make white tokens for human, uh, for the human token. So suddenly All Sayed is not uh, lethal anymore. Because if I name Pro Green, he can just block with the human. <laughs> and here we draw Sentinel's Eyes, 
which gives me vig Vigilance, which not only allows me to keep attacking, but prevent him from attacking back. So he keeps developing his board. I keep crossing my fingers for a uh, Griff Spoon. <laughs> so I thought this game was unlosable, but all of a sudden you see the opponent's got quite the board going. However, we also have uh, 74 life going on over 100 <laughs> with no end in sight. Opponent plays a Domri. Till <laughs> we make our guy even bigger. Continue growing our life total. So this is the crucial turn here. I actually messed up here. I ended up attacking, but what I failed to realize was that Ronus has Death Touch. I always forget this because it's such a random ability on such a big indestructible creature, but he does have Death Touch, so even though I have First Strike, he can just block. It's indestructible, and then Death Touch kills it. I do have the Curamenter's Blessing, so I, I kind of got to pretend I knew about that and didn't make a mistake, but... Unfortunately, he also has this Domri, which can make the Ronus fight, which he ends up doing. I lose my guy, and even though I'm at 232 life, uh, I'm going to end up dying to this board, and I have no way of threatening his life total, so I threw in the towel. On the play for game two, and one thing I will note, oh, a couple things to note about this hand. One is that I brought in all of my dead weights, and uh, the reason for that is one of the weird quirks about Obosh. Obviously you can only have odd converted mana cost cards, so this deck really relies on their mana elves to get from 1 to 3, because they have no 2 drops, obviously. So dead weight on an elf can really slow them down by multiple turns, so I ended up bringing in all my dead weights, even on the play, um, which I might not do against a normal red-green deck, just for that reason in particular. Um, I also kept this, even though this hand is an auto mulligan in the old version of the deck, but thanks to Luris is actually a keep, because like I said, we just get a free creature in our opening hand. So yeah, that's uh, context for you guys, and let's get this match started, or this game started, I should say. Kind of hoping he plays an elf here, which of course he does. So we just kill it. And yeah, the opponent cannot do anything here. But they do have Bone Crusher Giant off the top, which is relevant. But fortunately for us, we start drawing some creatures. And we can just create a giant favorite hoplite. Which is going to be pretty hard for the opponent to kill, especially once we have protection from it, or for it. And I actually end up splitting the difference here, making two giant threats in case of a scenario like we had before, where the opponent <laughs> is able to infinitely block with a with a stupid indestructible th uh, creature. So yeah, on to game three. So we've got another nice opener here. Unfortunately, this game is a little bit anticlimactic because the opponent ended up mulling to five on the play. And once we kill that uh, Lanoir Elves, it's pretty much GG. But we go ahead and yeah, I decided not even to, to put something on it, I just for maximum protection. And then once I cast the Karametra's Blessing, the opponent concedes, because they're going to have no way to get rid of a giant uh, Hateful Eidolon from here. It would be, what, a 3-4 growing into even bigger in the following turns. So it's notable here that even though we had two black cards in our hand, the Swamp ended up being kind of a hindrance which is part of the reason why I am cutting the Swamp, but we'll go over to the deck and uh, talk about that there. So yeah, as I said, this is how I would build the deck going forward. I got rid of the Swamp and added the Mana Confluence, um, put in a third Knight of Malice because I was really happy with how it played, how it's been playing over multiple leagues, and even though losing the fourth dead weight will hurt in some matchups, I think three is still going to be a pretty good number. Um, but yeah, this deck is super cheap to build, and it's extremely competitive, in fact, perhaps even tier 1 competitive. So if you're looking for a cheap Pioneer deck to build, this is the one for you. It's a lot of fun to play, maybe not for your opponents, but 
It's very powerful. Luris adds a lot to the deck, and I think it could be one of the best decks in the format now. So let me know what you think in the comments, and we'll see you next time.